the next paper is uh, Financial and Total Wealth Inequality with Declining Interest Rates. Uh, Dan Green will, I uh, believe, is going to present. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you so much <clears throat> for putting us on the program. Um, <laughs> let me apologize for my voice. It's been a long week of teaching. I've been tested by every possible COVID test known to modern medicine, so don't worry there, but um, I apologize for the audio. So this is joint work um, with Matteo Leambroni, who's an excellent PhD student coming out of Stanford. He'll be on the market. Also, Hanno Lustig and Stan Van Neuverberg is here. So our paper is motivated by the following time series observation. So uh, what I've plotted here in red is the bottom 90% share of financial wealth. In black is the 10-year real yields um, uh, on, on bonds. And what you can see is they're very strongly um, positively correlated, meaning the inequality and real rates are negatively correlated. So basically, um, for the first half of the sample, as the 10-year real yield is going up, you see inequality falling, the bottom 90% share rising. And after the 1980s, you see this very marked drop in interest rates, which is, uh, goes along with a rise in inequality or a drop in the bottom 90% share. Now, this is for US data. We show in the paper this also holds for France and the UK. So in terms of magnitudes, interest rates since the 1980s have fallen by uh, almost 500 basis points. The top 10% share has increased by about 8.5 percentage points. So there's a kind of a natural link between discount rates and asset prices, right? We know that moving around discount rates can change financial wealth, measured financial wealth. But this is still non-trivial to, to judge the relationship for two reasons. The first is that even though rates influence valuations, so a decline in discount rates will push up the value of assets, how that affects inequality depends on how portfolios across the wealth distribution are actually different from each other. If everybody had the same portfolio, the same decline in rates would push all wealth up proportionally the same amount. And then most of our measures we care about, like top 10% share and Gini, wouldn't change that much at all. In fact, they wouldn't change at all. So to the degree this matters for measured wealth inequality, you have to know basically how portfolio exposures vary across the population. Second, even to the extent we find that this matters for measured financial wealth, whether that is just gains on paper versus actual impacts on consumption is not clear because changing discount rates can change the measured value of a stream of cash flows holding the cash flows fixed. So to address this, we're going to ask two questions in this paper. First, what share of rising measured financial wealth inequality is explained by falling interest rates? Just the picture I showed you before. And second, what are the implications of this for the ultimate total wealth or consumption inequality that we might think that policymakers care more about? The approach we'll take in the paper is to combine uh, some new cross-sectional estimates of how household portfolios vary over the wealth distribution with a realistic consumption savings model to interpret the ultimate consumption outcomes and the exposure of the consumption plan. The results for our first question is we find this force is very powerful. Uh, the observed decline in rates, uh, combined with our estimates of portfolio exposures, is enough to fully explain the entire rise in the top 10% share since the 1980s. But we find that if agents were to be able to afford their pre-shock or pre-decline consumption plans, we would have not only needed to see the top 10% share not rise, it would have needed to fall by about five percentage points. This mismatch between the two means that it's actually not consumption neutral at all, but in fact there are big winners and losers. We find that the low wealth young are actually very harmed by this, while high wealth older agents gain, for reasons I'll, I'll make clear. So we're going to begin with um, a quick, some quick theory, go to the uh, calibrated <coughs> model. Then I'll show you the two, um, basically, um, setups I described. First is just asking what happens to the actual portfolio's households hold as rates change through repricing, as we'll call it. And next is what would happen to the compensated distribution, which is the amounts of wealth that you need to see households have to afford their pre-shock consumption plans. So let's start with just some simple theory to lay a groundwork. We're going to develop this in a very standard Bewley model environment, um, uh, following some work that uh, Hanno did with Dirk Kruger. Uh, this is going to be a very standard Bewley setup, but actually they show in that paper it nests actually a whole bunch of different uh, models with aggregate shocks and in, in, uh, idiosyncratic risk in complete markets. Okay? So this is actually a bit more general than it might seem. The first question we're going to ask is how financial wealth inequality should react to a change in interest rates. And the key statistic is duration of a household portfolio, right? So as we teach our MBAs, uh, this is equal to um, the, the duration of an asset tells you its elasticity of its value to a permanent change in gross discount rates. So if you wanted to know how much total measured financial wealth will increase following the decline in rates, you'd measure the aggregate duration across the entire economy, right? 
But in order to know what the impact is of a declining rates on financial wealth inequality, you need to know basically uh, how, there, to the extent there's heterogeneity in that duration, again, if everyone had the same duration, there would be no effect on proportional measures of inequality, but also how that heterogeneity lines up with existing, measure, existing financial wealth. That's going to be really the key. And the proposition we formalize is that if the covariance between financial wealth and duration is positive, then a decline in rates increases financial wealth inequality. In simple, intuitive terms, basically, uh, the higher your duration, the more you're exposed to interest rates, the more your portfolio goes up in value and rates fall. So if the rich people have this higher exposure, then inequality will actually go up as rates fall. And a sufficient condition for checking whether uh, this holds is just that the aggregate or wealth-weighted duration is greater than the average or equal-weighted duration. So we're going to be able to look at this directly as a moment in the data. Now, that's about the positive question of just how measured wealth will change. Now we're going to talk a bit about the consumption response. So if you just iterate forward on the budget constraint, you'll find this standard uh, identity, which is that measured financial wealth is equal to the expected present value of future excess cons consumption, meaning consumption net of your labor income. This is just an identity, right? It's, it, it has to hold at every period. But even though the levels have to be equal by, by construction, the two sides are not equally exposed to interest rates. You can think of it like a bank with a maturity mismatch, okay? And so basically, if the duration of the left side, the, the household's actual portfolio, is, um, is larger than the duration of the right side, then the, measured, then the financial wealth of the household will go up by more than they would need to afford their old consumption plan. Their consumption possibilities will expand. If the duration of the portfolio of the households actually hold is less than the duration of their consumption claim, uh, they actually, even though their financial wealth might go up, it won't go up by enough to afford their old consumption plan. Their possibilities will contract. Okay? And in fact, we show in the paper that if the durations are exactly equal, meaning they're ex perfectly hedged, uh, there's no effect on consumption at all. And in particular, the proposition we show is that the consumption allocation with high rates is still in equilibrium. The household will choose the exact same consumption allocation and consumption plan as long as you gave them enough financial wealth to be able to afford it. So we're going to call this measure of wealth, this theta, um, the, the measure of wealth that you would obtain that lets you exactly afford your old consumption plan, the compensated distribution. It's enough wealth to compensate you for any change in rates so you can still afford what you would have consumed previously. So now let's go quickly through the calibrated model. We'll get through it in uh, basically one slide. It's going to be a life cycle model that's super important because the durations of the young and old can be quite different on their excess consumption claim. Uh, we're going to have mortality risk and accidental bequests will be given to newborn agents. Uh, we're going to have standard power utility preferences with risk aversion 2. The discount factor will be 1 over beta. And now we need to calibrate the household's idiosyncratic income. Okay, so we're going to have this consist of a regular and superstar component. The first thing we do that's super important is we use a very comprehensive measure. So as has been shown in a, a great paper by uh, Catherine Miller and Saren, for example, whether or not you include Social Security has a big impact on how we measure inequality. So we're going to take um, a, a very broad stand here, and we're going to measure all the income coming into the household as best we can from every source, including not just wages and salaries, but the labor component of business income, transfer income, including Social Security, as well as defined benefit pensions. We're going to estimate this regular income process on PSID data with persistent and transitory uh, risk, as well as an age profile. And we're going to basically, because some of these um, income is still coming in in retirement, we're going to allow the consumption process, sorry, the income process to potentially be risky in retirement, but with different parameters. Now, if you ever worked with these models, you'll know that these kind of standard PSID calibrated things, they don't generate enough wealth inequality like we see in the data. So in order to get that right, we're going to introduce a superstar state um, where you have this chance of entering this very high income state. Um, and that basically lets us match it. We're going to calibrate this to exactly match the top 10% financial wealth share in the 1980s. The last thing we need in our model, which is very important, is what I'm about to show you in the data, which is that financial duration varies with household wealth, and in particular is increasing in household wealth. So how do we do these durations? We go to the survey of consumer finances, and so for a duration, you need to know what the household invested in the portfolio, like the assets, and then the duration of each asset. And if you have the portfolio shares and the asset durations, you can combine them to get a household duration. So that's what we do. We, go, we do this by asset class. We have an auxiliary asset pricing model. You can think about uh, the typical uh, log affine SDF models that fit asset prices really well statistically. And that gives us durations for um, equities, real estate, and private business wealth. Now, for private business wealth, we have to use small stocks. That's what we choose. Um, we get a high number, right? Small, um, this is the subject of a lot of robustness checks in the paper. 
Uh, it's kind of partially done, partially in progress. What I can tell you is as we've been looking into this more, what we can see, because the SCF breaks down what kind of private business wealth there is, um, and that the, um, the, you might think that be concerned that we're picking up something like dentists or something who have kind of a low duration. They're not, they don't have a lot of growth possibilities. The wealthiest agents in our sample actually have private business wealth that looks much more like a, a small equity. These are big companies that are actively managed and potentially growing with a lot of employees than um, private business wealth held by the non-very uh, top of the wealth distribution. Um, so for the other uh, items that are a little bit easier to just calibrate, we calibrate some durations for things like fixed income assets. And then we need portfolio shares, which we pull directly from the SCF. Okay? So these are all numbers from the 1980s, but we'll continue to update this as we go forward in time. Um, and so basically, the first thing that we're going to measure, if you remember from our proposition, is the aggregate versus average duration of financial um, wealth. And you can see that the aggregate or value-weighted duration is much higher than the, um, than the average or equal-weighted duration, implying, according to our proposition, that as rates are falling, we should indeed see financial wealth inequality going up because the rich are benefiting more than the poor. So um, to calibrate the model, we're going to run a regression of um, financial wealth duration on age and uh, some, a fine uh, set of financial wealth bins that actually get finer as we go higher up the wealth distribution. And what you can see here is that basically duration is very strongly increasing in financial wealth. It's very low at the bottom. It kind of flattens out for a while. And then toward the very top, as we get into the 90s and, and, and the top 1%, we see duration go up quite a bit more. Okay? So in the model, it's a Bewley economy, right? All of our shocks coming in are going to be total surprises. They're going to be MIT shocks, right? Unexpected, permanent changes. So the households actually don't care what portfolio they hold. We're going to leverage that to basically let us assign households the portfolio that we think they should have given the data. So what we're literally going to do is take the fitted values from this regression, and for each household, just give them the portfolio duration that this regression thinks they should have. Uh, and as a result, mostly by construction, we're, as a result, the model durations at each uh, bin are going to fit really well with the data. OK, so the first, now we're going to get into uh, our two exercises. So the first one is repricing. How does, do, um, the, does the wealth distribution change under the portfolios households actually hold? To build intuition, we're going to do this first in one shot. We're going to have the entire decline in rates since the 1980s occur in one moment. Right? That's obviously not realistic. So. Our quantitative uh, main results will come from more gradual experiment, but it's great for building intuition. So what do we see here, basically? Um, in blue, in the, this blue of the histogram, we have the original distribution. In green, we have the repriced one after everything gets revalued. And you can see it shifts way to the right, right? Because as discount rates are falling, all the wealth is getting uh, marked up, basically. Um, this actually creates quite a bit of wealth. And actually, everyone benefits to some degree. The poorest agents benefit very little because their durations are so low. This is the bin scattered by original wealth. And the, um, the richer agents actually all gain, right, basically, in terms of measured financial wealth. That's not very surprising. So now in order to understand what this uh, effect this had on measured inequality over the entire sample, we're going to run a gradual experiment where basically we apply the new interest rate year by year as a surprise, as basically another MIT shock, and see what happens. So wealth will be updating both because of these revaluations, according to the duration, and because of households' endogenous consumption savings response between periods. So here's what we find. The red line is the um, top 10% uh, share in our model. And you can see that basically it really matches very well with what the, the actual data in black. And we're able to explain roughly 100% of the increase. Okay? If you look at the right panel, this is actually kind of an interesting composition of two forces. So the blue, the blue line would be what we'd get if we just applied our revaluations period by period and ignored the endogenous consumption savings response. Um, the, um, but that's offset by this effect from the green line because actually steady state inequality under low interest rates is not higher. It's actually lower, uh, partially because there are fewer opportunities to compound high returns. So what's going on is all this is a persistent but temporary effect, whereas rates have been falling, households get these really big capital gains. Okay. But over time, that's slowly reverting. And so actually fitting, uh, getting this really good fit actually is, is a composition of basically these large revaluations that overshoot and this mean reversion effect going toward the new steady state that actually uh, uh, takes some uh, of that away. So basically, this is just how we fit different moments quantitatively. Uh, we do quite well on the genie at top 10% share. Top 1% share, we do um, uh, pretty well, maybe a little bit 
uh, overstated, partially because our model overweights the top 1%. So now let's go into the um, consumption possibility results. <coughs> so now what we're going to do is compute the compensated distribution. This asks, um, for a given household, not what did they actually get given their actual portfolio, but what would they have needed in order to be able to afford their old consumption plan before interest rates changed. And basically, this is uh, the orange thing here. So what you can see is that, again, the orange uh, bars are quite moved to the right compared to blue because uh, the consumption plans are also increasing in value as discount rates fall. And in fact, this compensated distribution creates about as much wealth as repricing. So actually, there's about as enough wealth in this economy to redistribute to everybody. But as you can see, the shape of the orange and green, which is the repriced one, are quite different. So what households actually get under their actual portfolios in green here is quite different than what they need in the orange line. In particular, you can see the orange one actually is a lot less unequal. It's actually left skewed rather than right skewed. So this discrepancy is going to lead to consumption responses. This means we're not perfectly hedged. So to see this, who kind of who gains and who loses, well, well, we'll get to who gains and who loses in a second. What I'm going to show you is actually this by age. So on the x-axis, I have the starting financial wealth. On the y-axis, I have how much they actually need under the compensated distribution. The yellow dots are the youngest agents. Purple are the oldest. And what you can see is that the youngest agents actually need a lot of compensation. Right? They're way above the 45-degree line. These are households who um, uh, basically are planning to save in middle age, meaning their excess consumption is negative, and then dissave in retirement. So the duration of their excess consumption claim is super long. Okay? They need a lot of compensation. The value of that claim goes way up when rates fall. As households get older, this is actually declining. So the, the amount of compensation they need is shrinking, and then eventually really falling as they get quite old. So the, let's now look by wealth. The poorest agents actually include a lot of really old agents who have very low rate, need a little compensation, and a lot of very young agents need a ton because it's non-monotonic, who wins? It turns out that the effect of the young dominates, um, basically. So that actually the least wealthy agents uh, actually need the most compensation. <clears throat> so now let's see if they get it. On the left panel, I have on the x-axis the, um, the amount of new wealth they need under compensation. On the y, I have what they actually get under repricing. The young, the yellow dots, need tons of compensation, but they get very little because their durations are not that high on financial wealth. And also, uh, they don't have that much wealth in general to multiply. Duration is always a proportional concept anyway. As households get older, you can see that basically uh, they get closer to being correctly hedged until the oldest agents in retirement age are actually overhedged and gain from the large capital gains. If we aggregate this by wealth, the y-axis is now how much you actually got relative to what you needed, so negative means you lost. And you can see that actually the poorer agents are losing while the richest agents actually gain slightly from this. So um, basically what we find is as a result, not only would the top 10% share have needed to not increase, it would have needed to decline for agents to be able to afford their old uh, consumption plans. Okay? If we look at total wealth, we see that in general the, the overall inequality and the change in inequality is much lower because the young have a lot of very high duration labor income. That's the difference between total and, and, and financial wealth. Um, but actually the patterns are still qualitatively the same. With the last thing, let me show you one kind of neat thing before I wrap up. We can use the model to actually look at which cohorts have gained and lost from declining interest rates. So what I did here is look at agents who were born in each of these decades, um, each of these years, and look at how they, their current consumption or total lifetime consumption, this kind of lifetime consumption, evolved in the actual path that happened compared to the 1980s steady state. So these are percent deviations from what someone of the same age would have gotten in the 1980s steady state. And what you can see is basically the older cohorts like here, they have a big increase in, in present value of lifetime wealth coming from these declines in interest rates that actually gave them a ton more capital gains at, because they came in at times when those agents had a lot of wealth already. Whereas um, basically the younger cohorts, you can see, like if you're born in the 80s, 90s, or 2000s, you don't have any wealth by the time that the, the decline in rates is occurring. And actually, um, you mostly lose from not having the high returns you would need to be able to uh, accumulate retirement savings and then spend out of, out of your savings in retirement. So actually, the younger cohorts, like the millennials and Gen Z, are actually losing about almost 10% of their uh, present value of lifetime consumption at birth um, from this effect. So let me wrap up here. In this paper, we asked how declines in asset returns influence financial and total wealth inequality. We combined some data on household portfolios with a life cycle model to generate consumption predictions to create our repriced and compensated financial wealth distributions. 
repricing the actual thing we expect to happen given households' actual portfolios uh, is quantitatively very powerful. We can actually explain basically all of the rise in financial wealth inequality just from this one source. Whereas in terms of real effects, we find that there is a big mismatch between these repriced and compensated distributions. Households are not perfectly hedged. And in fact, the low wealth young were quite harmed by the declining rates, whereas older and wealthier households actually gain from large asset appreciations. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, the discussion is out Simsek. Thank you, Dan. <coughs> and um, thanks a lot for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. And so, as Dan um, mentioned, this paper is motivated by uh, the observation that in recent decades, interest rates have been declining and wealth inequality has been going up. And that uh, raises the question of whether there's any relationship and which way the relationship might go. There is one. Okay, so, and this paper's argument is that, in fact, um, the decline in rates can cause the increase in wealth inequality. There's, a, there's smoking gun evidence to think that, right? You know, you might imagine the declining rates will increase aggregate wealth, and maybe it also increases aggregate wealth inequality. Turns out that actually what matters for that is the duration, uh, heterogeneity across the households, and they try to measure the duration in the data, and they find that with measured duration, declining rates, in fact, can explain more than enough of the rise in, rise in wealth inequality. But then the paper is actually more ambitious than that. It sort of tries to also say something about uh, consumption or welfare inequality, which is a much harder problem because it requires you to think about human capital wealth as well as the timing of consumption driven by many factors. And so they build a calibrated Beely model, life cycle model, to get at this question. And they, their model suggests that actually it's not just paper and wealth that which is gaining. It's actually, it's, uh, it also increases their consumption or welfare according to their model. And they also find that actually the wealthier and the older households uh, tend to gain uh, from the gain, gain, gains uh, relatively more from the decline uh, in rates. So in my discussion, I'll try to um, argue that I think the, quest, the first question, uh, the analysis of that question is actually very important. And uh, it's a great idea to write a measure that I think they, they do a reasonably good job. And, and I have some questions about the magnitudes, but qualitatively, um, uh, I, 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 I agree with your answer that, uh, that declining rates probably contribute to the wealth increase in wealth inequality. I'll try to argue that actually the second question is not only much harder, you know, but, but the way they pose it and the way I, I put it on the slide is, is not even a well posed question. So it's not, you cannot sort of say increase in rates, in, increase or decrease in wealth inequality without taking a stand on what is causing that decline in rates. It really depends on what is causing the decline in rates. And so they do answer a more narrow question, which if you take the, you know, the view that rates are going down because of growth, which is the view that they take, then under their model, maybe you can say something. But more broadly, I think it's, a, it's an open question. So, so why did the rates decline? So I think that's kind of an important prior question before we get into this, this, this debate. And um, there's actually uh, many explanations out there for the secular decline. It's like really like an explanation zoo. And so, um, for instance, maybe we'll emphasize the demographics that uh, aging population needs to save more, and that increases the aggregate saving rate. Where people emphasize actually the reverse channel increase. There's an increase in income inequality, and that you know rich save more, so that puts the money into the hands of the people who save more and increases the aggregate savings rate. Where people emphasize global factors like maybe emerging markets, especially China. Uh, uh, high-growing uh, emerging markets say more, and that actually puts downward pressure on interest rates. And then there's growth technology-related explanations, which is the position they take. That didn't emphasize, but this is the position they take in the paper. And then there are many other explanations. Okay, so um, so uh, you know, if you look at this list, it's clear that there, there is probably not just one explanation. So their explanation cannot be the only thing, and I'm not even sure if it's the main thing that's going on in the data, okay? And you know, you, you might say, okay, maybe it doesn't matter, but I'm, I'll try to argue that it matters. And in fact, one way it matters is that if you want to understand why rates are declining and wealth is growing at the same time, like jointly explain the two things, actually, the savings related explanations are much more promising starting point than the growth related uh, explanations. So let me try to use a simple model to illustrate that point, okay? So, so imagine uh, two days, so they have very sophisticated view of a very simple two-period model. Okay, so, so uh, growth, uh, there's like the exogenous growth, and there's a market portfolio claim on output, and its price is P0. 
and for now close the economy, and for now agents have a slow utility. So you can solve this model in many ways, but uh, let me try to solve it in a way that I find intuitive to uh, kind of uncover broader insights, okay? So here, people will spend a constant fraction of their wealth, depends on NPC, and NPC is increasing in the discount rate. And if you set that uh, uh, Y equal to Y star potential, you can solve asset prices, right? That's how you get that equation for asset prices. And you can also solve the interest rate that gives you that, uh, that asset price. And if you look at these equations, you see it, G and rho, the discount rate and rho can enter very different. So the rho explains the decline in rates and also the increase in asset prices, aggregate wealth. G, uh, under my assumption specification log utility, actually explains the decline in rates, but it doesn't explain the increase in wealth. And why is that? Well, if you look at kind of my derivation, it's clear why that is because, you know, so when rho declines, NPC is lower. So basically, transmission from aggregate wealth to spending is, is declined. So you need bigger aggregate wealth to generate the same amount of spending and to clear the goods market, right? So, so rho shows up in that transmission equation. That's why it has a very direct impact on aggregate wealth. In fact, I would argue that aggregate wealth comes in first. You first you know, realize that aggregate wealth needs to go up, and interest rate is the, the tool that brings that up uh, about. Okay, so um, but what happens if G declines? Well, G doesn't show up in that transmission equation. G is about asset valuation. So when G declines, nothing in that equation changes. So aggregate wealth doesn't need to change. So that's basically fully absorbed by the interest rate. Right? Interest rate um, does the G decline, but you get an interest rate effect either way, but you don't get the price effect with, uh, with, with the G explanation. So um, now, uh, how do they get down the increase in wealth? Well, because they change the preferences. Right? So they work with uh, preferences with EIS less than one. And I'm sure you could do with other equations, see how this works out. But continue with my uh, uh, sort of line of thinking here. You see, I think, more clearly what's going on. There is still an equation that is still like an NPC here. But that NPC becomes endogenous to the interest rate. When the interest rate goes down, NPC goes down as well. So when, what happens then when G goes down, people are willing, become willing to spend less out of wealth. So again, you need to engineer a bigger wealth to generate the same thing, right? So, so you need to do more gymnastics in this kind of way. To, it's, more, more, it's, not, it's more endogenous driven in the MPC, decline, driven by the decline in, in the interest rate, right? And, and I'm not even sure if I find the mechanism intuitive. What is the mechanism? Interest rates go down, people realize they're gonna have low income in the future, income effects are powerful, so they wanna save more. I'm sure that's relevant for some people, like middle-aged retirees, but for most people, I would think the other thing is more relevant. If the interest rates go down, you want to save less, right? That's kind of like the partial equilibrium kind of thinking. So, or maybe they just save the constant amount. They just follow rules. I, again, I find it a lot more intuitive than what's going on here. The point is that their mechanism is kind of on a little bit shaky, intuitive ground. It also re relies on this EIS being less than one, and the empirical estimates of that are all over the, all over the Okay, so so uh, if you want to explain aggregate wealth increase, I start with this kind of explanations. And let me throw a, a third explanation out there, which is maybe some of you are thinking, why do we even need to do any of this? Let's just take a partial equilibrium kind of thing. Let's assume like open economy and make <coughs> rates go down, then you know, aggregate wealth goes up. Right? So in open economy, there is no link between aggregate wealth and output trade uh, as, as and so basically, this is a very straightforward explanation, right? And it could be relevant. Maybe it's not relevant for, for the U.S., but even for the U.S., there were global factors reducing interest rates, so this might be relevant as well. Okay, all right, but of course, there's a question. So I gave you three explanations for why rates might be declining and wealth might be going up. So there's a question of, does this matter? Why am I showing you this? It turns out that it matters. In fact, it matters for both of their analysis, for the repricing analysis, as well as the welfare analysis. So, so let me think about the repricing analysis in, in this like, little world. Right? Right, so suppose there are two assets. There's a short asset, it's a claim on current output, and there's a long asset, claim on the future output. And there's a two types of households, high and low wealth, and they start uh, ex ex exogenous uh, uh, shares, uh, total shares, XH and XL. Uh, XH is going to be uh, um, related to a wealth share. The XH is bigger, so those are the wealthy guys. But they also have unmodeled duration heterogeneity. They start with different portfolios for unmodeled reasons. Okay, so if you look at the wealth here, I mean, it's just that the, the sum of the two components of the portfolio. If you look at the wealth share, you get this expression here. And you see from here, they're one of their main results, which is, uh, you know, what matters when the rates decline, what matters to wealth inequality depends on the covariance of duration with wealth, right? So if the DH and DL were the same, so that term would drop out, and in fact, wealth inequality wouldn't change. 
But if the DH is bigger, then you get an increase in, in wealth inequality, and then show you that, right, as a general result. But, but you see here another thing. In fact, what matters is not RF, but G minus RF. So if you are engineering a declining RF from a declining G, you're still going to get a qualitative same effect, but in terms of the magnitudes, it's going to be a little damp convection. So in their uh, version, you're going to get the, the magnitude qualitatively, things will go in the right direction, but because of the way they're generating the um, wealth increase, this is going to be, uh, so interest rate decline is going to be dampened. In my version and the open economy version, the, you know, basically you can just think about the decline in our Okay, so, but you know, actually this matters for their empirical mark-to-market -market exercise because they, their empirical mark-to-market -market exercise is actually much more in line with like a partial equilibrium, you know, because they just they do something very straightforward. They take the initial durations and in, in decrease the rates and ask how much wealth will change. That's fine in my low utility world. It's fine in the partial equilibrium world. It's not fine in their world where G is also going down. So you also need to take into account the fact that wealth is holding longer duration assets, but those are also low, high growth assets. So if G is going down, you're going to get a dampened impact if you, know, if you actually account for it. Okay. So I mean, I like that exercise because I think the low utility world is more sensitive, sensible, but there's a bit of an issue in their, their the explanations that they, 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 they put into the paper. Okay. So all right, here's actually the welfare inequality is um, a bigger um, challenge, I think. So, so for welfare inequality, it's not enough to think about financial wealth. You need to also think about you know, the timing of your income, uh, life cycle considerations, as well as the timing of your consumption. Again, maybe people spend the different amounts at different times. So, so you get this budget constraint now, and you see now um, declining rates is not going to just matter through revaluation of your financial wealth. It's going to also matter through you know, the, uh, what they called excess consumption duration, the duration of your consumption versus uh, income. And you know, it's a very difficult question, I think, and their approach is to think about this compensated wealth, sort of the idea that, you know, what is the wealth that I can give to these guys that, so that after the interest rate change, the earlier consumption that they were doing is still feasible, right? So you can calculate that, and, uh, and that seems like a sensible thing to do, and, but is that the right thing to do? How does, it, how does it work in the three different explanations that I kind of laid out for? In their world, actually, it works fine. Because it, you know, they, change, they don't play with preferences. They, they, they reduce the growth rate. So you can do like compensated variation type analysis. You can say, OK, in this new world, how much I need to give these guys to, to feel, for them to feel as good as before. Like conceptually, it's fine. There is still an issue of whether people are willing to stay with their old positions or not. But you, know, sort of, you, know, you can argue that it's OK. If in the open economy version, actually, it's not okay because in the open economy, if you lower the interest rates, people actually don't want to stay with their old consumption plans. In fact, they want to front load their consumption plans. So, so basically, it's conceptually not the right thing to do. So your compensated wealth is going to be, you know, distortionary because it doesn't take into account that people also can would like to change their tilt their consumption profile. Okay, so you know whether or not it biases in economy measures, I don't know, but conceptually, it's missing something. Now, if you come to my world, my preferred world, where it's driven by discount rates, then actually it becomes even more problematic because preferences change. So it's very difficult to do this compensation variation analysis. You're like comparing apples to oranges, right? So it's like, I'm going to give you the same wealth as if you're doing 1980 consumption, but you don't want to do 1980 consumption anymore. Your preferences have shifted. So, so it's like an apple to oranges thing, okay? And leaving that aside, the apple to oranges thing, just to think about how this might bias things. Actually, it can bias the results quite a bit if the decline in discount rate has been heterogeneous in the population, right? If you think about this discount rate type explanations, in fact, there's many, there are many reasons to think this might have shifted heterogeneously in the population. For instance, there's evidence that suggests the savings rate of the rich has increased, in fact, more than the poor. In fact, this is a paper by Strong, Mian, and Sufi. What they show empirically is the savings rate of the rich has been going up, wealth has been going up, but savings rate of the poor actually has been going down. So there has been not just a decline in raw, effective raw on average, but as a very heterogeneous shift, uh, shift in raw. So if that happens, then you know if you keep people's roles the same as 1980, you're, you're, you're like to find you're likely to find bias, right? So so what's going on? The wealthy, for some reason, I'm going to come back to why this might be the case, want to push their consumption to the future. So in fact, they require a bigger compensation now to do this consumption. But their consumption duration have increased. But you're keeping their 
duration the same as before, so you're kind of finding results biased towards too little compensation for the world. Okay? Actually, the similar issues might apply to the, to the, the age as well. Okay? There are reasons to think, if you think about these demographic explanations, the middle age and the old, in fact, are saving more because they worry about retirement. So again, there, maybe there's, if their consumption duration has increased and you're kind of finding biases toward too little compensation for them. And, you know, uh, I, they, in fact, they tend to find that old, uh, old tend to gain from the rates decline. But I wonder, because I think this goes against conventional wisdom, right? The conventional wisdom is that the middle aged old are saving for retirement and they are the ones that are hurt by the low rates. This is what you read in the press all the time. So, you know, I think they also have onto something. The young people also complain about asset prices having become really expensive. And so there's something that they're picking up, but there, there are other things going on. And the bottom line here is that I think welfare analysis is actually very complicated. And they, they do, you know, give some answers, but these answers are very specific to the particular model that they've developed, in particular, assuming that preferences have not really shift, shifted. And, you know, then, you know, it's an exercise, but I think it's useful to be aware of the limitations uh, of the interest. Okay. All right, so let me turn to the part of the paper that I like writing about. So the declining rates and the wealth inequality. Um, this, I think, this exercise by itself is interesting, and I find this exercise definitely uh, very valuable. And they do a careful job. And so as Dan said, the idea here is to try to calculate house, uh, household level duration. You know, look at the household assets and survey consumer finances and assign a duration to every asset and look at the duration, how much each household uh, in this kind of partial equilibrium type uh, exercise benefits or loses from the changes rate in rates. The issue there is in the details. So if, you, if I look at their table, I cannot fully say that I understand their asset pricing model that generates the duration numbers. It's a very sophisticated model, and I'm sure it's a great model. But just numbers that come out, some of them don't pass my smell test. Okay, so the private business duration seems extraordinarily high, and Dan mentioned that. And they have a footnote explaining why that is. And that footnote says, well, you know, they, they associate with small stocks, and they find in their uh, model 8% expected return for small stocks and 7% cash flow growth. So that gives you this enormous duration. Okay? I have issues with the, both of them. The private business 8% return seems too low to me because these businesses are very risky. I think my brother is a manager in a private business, and I checked with him, and they cannot even borrow with debt at these rates. It's actually more than 10% just to take on debt, right? So I think probably their rate of return equity is closer to 20%, and they're not even that risky. And the growth number, yes, they do grow fast. These small businesses grow fast, but, but it's not permanent, right? If you grow at 7% for 10, 20 years, you become a big, big business, and then you start growing like a small, big business, right? So, so again, I think there's a little, there seems like a very aggressive calibration to me. And, and you know, it does matter for the results. Like, I mean, to their credit, they're actually very transparent about this, and they do, uh, you know, robustness with what happens when you assign private business to stocks to uh, stock market duration. And then they, they find smaller magnitudes. Right? So the increase in inequality is only 5% as a percentage point as opposed to 13 percentage point. 8 percentage point comes from this calibration of duration of private business because private business is very concentrated at the top. Like many wealthy people have private business, so if you think it's high duration, you get a very big uh, increase. Now, there's another thing in this table that's kind of my final world um, suspicious, the real estate. Uh, you know, I always thought housing was more durable than stocks. I'm a little surprised to see that housing has like half the duration of equities. I don't really know what in the asset pricing model generates that, but uh, you know, it doesn't, again, maybe I'm missing something, but my intuition would be the exact opposite. And this will matter, I think, too, because real estate and housing tends to be a lot more evenly distributed. Like many more people hold houses than, than stocks. And I don't know which way it goes, but it, it might matter. It, it probably would change the numbers, right? So my suggestion here is that to do more robustness for these different duration numbers and, and also more breakdowns, right? Okay, so people can have, the, I can have my own duration number in mind. It would be useful to kind of know what is driving, which one explains how much, just like you do with private business, you can do it for different asset classes as well, right? So I think it would be useful. Another thing that would be useful for this part of the paper, I think, is to discuss where this duration heterogeneity comes from. Right? Because they, they take it as exogenous. But once we understand what is driving the results, we could start asking the question of why is it that the wealthy have higher duration? Is it stock market participation? Is it that they, you know, they are basically more inclined to private business? And that's what, you know, so it would be useful to understand the deeper forces that drives 
duration and turgidity. Now, the other thing is actually, I think it's good for them that the results are not too big because they say they explain more than 100% of the rise in inequality. Well, there are many other explanations for rising inequality, right? So actually, that suggests that they might be over explained. Right? So, so um, one thing that's going on in the data that's pretty clear is income inequality has been going up. In fact, wealth inequality, people debate and predict whether how much is going up, et cetera. This is, um, there's much more consensus that income inequality has been going up. And this is permanent income inequality. Like, labor economists have analyzed this quite a bit, and this is driven by things like skill bias, technology, globalization. So these are like permanent increase in income. And basically, I, I know pretty much in every model that I can write down, permanent income inequality will eventually translate into wealth inequality. Right? So, so that means that some of the wealth inequality must be this. So we're explaining more than 100% suggests you're over explaining. Right? So I think, in fact, it's, but there's some benefit to damping down your results a little bit. In fact, this permanent income inequality, as I mentioned earlier, gives you also a reverse causality type explanation as well, as Ludwig Straub argued in his job market paper, as, you, as wealth accumulates in the hands of the rich because of income inequality and a skill bias technical change, then these guys start saving more because at some point they just run out of spending opportunities. Like right? you buy your private jet and helicopter, what else you're gonna buy? So just set it aside. And then that you know tends to increase the aggregate savings rate and push down the interest rate. Okay, so anyway, so I think I'm, I'm out of time. So let me, it's a very nice paper. I think these are very important questions. I think the welfare uh, inequality is a very difficult question to crack and depends on the precise reasons. And um, so my suggestion would be to tone down the ambition of the paper and to focus on the financial wealth inequality and to do more there. Okay? So like to do more robustness, more mechanisms, um, and things like that. So we stop. Thank you. And Dan, want to take some questions? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Al. Um, questions? Yeah. Just on the echo, uh, one thing I've said, which is, is if we're particularly interested to we can try to model directly the relation between duration and uh, and wealth, and so the duration of the portfolio wealth. That's completely exogenous, correct? In the model, that sounds you know this, it sounds kind of really important for wealth, in, for thinking about policy and so on. Uh, I know you already have a complicated model, but there's one aspect that seems like. No, look, I think can I say something about yeah. that? I think that's a great question. I mean, I see that as kind of the next paper to be written. I mean, we've we spent a lot of time in finance trying to understand people's portfolios, and we know it's a complicated question. You know, we know it's you know, private business opportunities, while only the very rich get presented those opportunities. Stock market participation, there's a whole literature on that. You know, it's correlated with financial sophistication and so forth and so forth, right? So to get into all of that in this paper doesn't seem like the right decision. Uh, you know, we take the stance that we're gonna take that relationship from the data and see what the implications are for our question. Uh, but I think it's an interesting I direction to push. Yeah, Larry. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to... Uh, Follow up on Alp's question about the duration of private business, because the <coughs> it seems very distinct about private equity versus public equity is that the number of periods for which you might get cash flows is potentially just chopped off once whoever the key employee is. And that would seem to like mechanically mean that the duration can't be that big, especially for an older person. And so how do you think right if you're using sort of a perpetuity formula and we think like maybe we want to use more of an annuity type formula, especially given the Zwick uh, Zadar Yegan type evidence on owner deaths. Because it, 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 that does seem like something that's very distinct between those two asset classes and it might matter a lot. Sure, so we're trying to do quite a bit on this right now. So basically the SCF is very nice because they break down by, <clears throat> sorry guys, by partnership and, and S Corp, C Corp, number of employees, a lot of characteristics of the private business. And so what hopefully we'll have in the, in the next version of the paper is a version where basically Everything that looks like it could be like a dentist's office with a key employee, we're going to give them a duration like 10. Yep. And then um, everything that looks like it's a business that has a lot of employees could continue to grow, looks more like just a small growing company, we're going to use a higher duration. Um, so far, because the very richest people have so much more of the type that doesn't look like a dentist's office, so as you go up to the top, 1%, <clears throat> they really hold more stuff that looks like companies uh, in their private business, according to the SCF. Uh, we think this will carry through. Maybe you'll see some dampening, but we're we're definitely headed in that direction. Thinking carefully about this idea. The other thing to say about so you know, mm -hmm. Al mentioned we use small stocks right now in our in our baseline calibration, and he pointed out well, no company can grow for at six percent forever, right? which is why we're also doing an exercise where we're looking at the firms and we're, lo we're looking at the identity of the firms as they transition through the different size 
quintiles or, or deciles of the distribution and take that into account. Uh, and that lowers the duration a little bit, but not all that much. Yeah. We end, still end up with a number like 55 to 60 in that case, even if we take those transitions into account. And the other point I would make is that by the time these firms are publicly listed, they've already been growing for many, many years before that point. And, and so that the fact that we don't capture that tends to understate the duration of those firms, right? So, you know, there may be some forces in the opposite direction. There's also some forces that lead us to, to kind of, in some sense, think that that might, number might even be too small, you know. All of this is to say that this is an important number in the paper. We do a lot of robustness. We spend a ton of time on this, a lot of data work, uh, you know, and we present robustness with respect to these numbers. I think that's kind of the, the best we can do. Yeah. I'm doing something to take into account the payment option on mortgages. It seems like this would help the, the middle income, middle, middle age uh, people. It's yeah. in there. Yeah. Our duration measure is, is um, it's reduced basically for this. And the duration of the mortgage is only like five and a half years, which is the duration of the Barclays MBS index, which takes all that prepayment into account. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it seems to me like your equity duration is too high. Uh, if you regress stuff <coughs> on uh, interest rate shocks from out your policy, you get like half the number. And, and I think it's because you ignored repurchases, it looks like, and, and they've gotten much bigger than dividends. Um, so, so maybe you should... Can I say something yeah, about so, the, right so all of these duration calculations, this actually also answers one of Al's questions about housing, uh, stocks, and, and then, you know, that all comes from an asset pricing model that's in the back, which actually matches the entire history of price dividend ratios, dividend growth, interest rates. Yeah, but no repurchases. It said in your footnote that you were just looking at dividends. Yeah, so that has dividend growth. That's the way we usually do it. You could. You could include repurchases in that calculation. Well, I think you should. Uh, yeah. I don't know how much the sensitivity analysis would. Um, you said you'd do sensitivity analysis. I think the real estate is probably okay, isn't it? but the equity ones. We can look into that issue. Yeah, John. I was wondering, uh, maybe you explained it and I missed it, but does in how do the income depend on the interest rate? So, for example, many people in finance and hedge funds make more money when the interest rates go up. They're taking a percentage of the profit, and if the profit goes up, just because the interest rate goes up, they do better. So that's sort of a countervailing force. But do you have an explicit model for whose income depends on what the interest rate is? We don't. In fact, it's exogenous. It doesn't depend on it at all. So I think this is a great point, and it actually links back to something Alexi was saying as well. There's a lot of things that happen, actually, even to some of Alps' comments. A lot of things happen over this period. Well, the way you can, and you can imagine that there are things going on that we're not picking up. What we're trying to say is, if you just take a basic model and put in just one factor happening, basically just the interest rate going down, leaving almost everything else fixed, it's powerful enough to explain a lot of the increase in inequality. So I don't want to um, uh, um, say that things like that are not happening in any way, but it's kind of interesting to us that this one force by itself can be quite powerful. Yeah. Um, so with the inflation going up, is it obvious what happens in your model or, I mean, in your results? This is about very long-term real rate movements. I think actually it's a super interesting way to go. You can imagine redoing this exercise for different types of shocks that would hit different assets in different ways. And so duration wouldn't be a sufficient statistic there. You'd have to measure mm -hmm. inflation exposures. Yeah. But you could do similar uh, things. I think it would be a, a great place to go with this methodology. Yeah. Um, if I have one minute, let me just uh, first just thank Alp as well uh, for the great discussion. I definitely actually agree with a lot of what he said about the growth rate motivation. Uh, actually, as he mentioned, because we're doing this a little bit in partial equilibrium, what we're doing is maybe even more consistent already with a pure discount rate shock than with a growth shock, and I think that's where we're heading in general. Um, the one place I'd like to push back a little bit is on some of this consumption and welfare stuff. So I guess I would say a couple things. So first of all, the shock that we put in, and this is actually the right way to do it for a growth shock in our stationary version of a growing economy model, or with a discount rate shock, usually, is we shock beta and R at the same time. Um, so basically, um, there actually is no apples to oranges problem in terms of the consumption plan. We prove it as a proposition. The agents, because beta is going up as R is going down, you can imagine that the change in beta is what's driving R, for example. They actually would consume the exact same bundle. So I think that's not such a problem. Now, of course, this is kind of taking a big swing, right? We're relying on the model for these numbers about compensation. That's definitely true. What I would say is we're kind of sympathetic to these ideas that we don't want to kind of um, go too crazy in terms of that these welfare numbers are very sensitive to preference parameters, things like this. We thought of this compensated distribution, which actually doesn't in a direct way depend on 
um, how much you enjoy consumption, but just what you would need to be able to afford it. And as Alp says, maybe there are different, if households have different, there's heterogeneous ways in which their discount rates are affected. Maybe the rich would want a different bundle or something. That's kind of a, a broader question that's much more tied to the model parameterization. What we're asking is just how much would you need to be able to afford your old bundle, which of course is model dependent, but uh, I think quite a bit more robust uh, against some of these issues. Um, any other questions here? We should probably move on. Okay, thanks Thank so much. You guys.